Thanks for tuning in to an Academy of International Mobile Healthcare Integration webinar. This webinar is being recorded. To ask questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom represented by the double dialog bubble button. The chat function will be disabled for participants, but you'll be able to see others' questions in the Q&A and up and down vote them. If you are joining us on Facebook, please like or love the stream and ask questions in the comments. The recorded session will be emailed to all registrants tomorrow and will be available for on-demand playback on the AIM High website. AIM High is the Academy of International Mobile Healthcare Integration. And you can see here some of the principles for um, the principles followed by our organizations. Um, with that, it is my absolute pleasure to thank our current AIM High members and to turn this presentation over to Frank Gresh, who will be your first presenter today. Good morning, everyone. I'm trying to share the screen. There we go, sharing the screen and and turning my video on so people can see me and see the presentation. I hope that's working right, because now we're going to go. So uh, part of my conversation this morning is just talking about uh, a little bit of cybersecurity, but but cybersecurity in the context of things that keep us uh, EMS CIOs up at night. Uh, and in the interest of not making this a 12 and a half hour webinar, um, we're going to take the uh, top 10 list and make it the top six list today. So number six on my list of things that keep me awake at night is the internet of things. There are lots and lots of things out there. Uh, I know I when I looked at my home internet uh, here a couple of days ago, I have like 72 things on my network at home. Uh, I don't look at that number on my work network because it's a lot more than that. But the internet of things, and you fill in the blank, whether they're, they're watches, scales, speakers, thermostats, uh, you name it, uh, are on there. And now we see lots and lots of healthcare devices. There are sensors out there. Uh, so in other words, there is a significant opportunity for this internet of things to be connected to your network at work. And with more opportunity comes more risk. So many of you have heard about the uh, the casino in Las Vegas that had probably the largest casino system breach um, in the history of casino breaches. Uh, and it all stemmed from a thermostat in a fish tank. Um, it's the only casino that had data that communicated to Finland. I would consider that to be an anomaly. Uh, and it also um, used traffic that you would not expect to see moving to and from a casino. So from a lot of different perspectives, the Internet of Things is a significant challenge. Let's talk about number five, another thing that keeps me awake at night, the cloud. So it's not a question of if, it's definitely when. And, and most everybody, and I would venture to say probably a significant number of people on this webinar today, uh, are in some shape, form, or fashion utilizing the cloud. Talk about a market, 331.2 billion this year is the Gartner estimate from about a year or so ago. How safe is it? Well, how much money do you have? Uh, and, and essentially, uh, it is as safe as you can make or pay for it. Um, and, and we're seeing an increasing number of public safety functions are available and routinely in the cloud. EPCR is probably the first one that comes to mind, but we're seeing computer-aided dispatch, certainly billing, fleet inventory scheduling, CAD-to-CAD -CAD interfaces, and a variety of different things that are available in the cloud. It's all well and good because there's a lot of benefits by being in the cloud, but there's also a lot of, you know, a lot of concerns about being in the cloud. Notice I highlighted security. That is a big concern about being in the cloud, but there's also a lot of other things. And if you have control issues, you probably are one of the last ones to get to the cloud just because there are lots of gotchas to avoid. Make sure when you step into this um, and you move to the cloud, make sure you read the fine print. Number four, X or fill in the blank where. Uh, so uh, malware, ransomware, spyware, adware, scareware, hijackware, you name it, it's out there. Um, there are certainly a variety of different ways that people are gaining access to the systems. Uh, and, and I love this term that was coined and it's been around for a while now. We have viruses in the wild. Well, we've got real viruses <laughs> that are biological in the wild and we've got real viruses of the IT variety that are in the wild as well. 
Uh, and many times those things uh, happen in form of what they call a zero day exploit. So the way a lot of traditional um, malware protection systems work is, is that we uh, know what the signature of this particular bad thing looks like. And so therefore we try to avoid that bad thing. Well, unfortunately, um, these zero day exploits aren't, don't have a signature. So you've got to use systems that uh, prevent that. Why do we want to prevent that? Well, here is exactly why we want to prevent that. These are all healthcare or public safety related data um, ransomware events or other hijacks here in the last two, three years. Uh, obviously, one that impacted us here at EMSA was the city of Tulsa went completely down. I mean, they, they shut everything down. Their CAD systems, record systems, uh, public facing IT, computer, I mean, the whole nine yards, they had to shut it all down. Um, and we're a year plus later, uh, and, and they're still struggling uh, to get all of those systems back up online, functioning at the level they were before this attack. It's been a major deal for them. Shadow IT. Uh, if you don't know what shadow IT is, uh, that's IT that occurs in your organization uh, outside of the IT department knowing about it. And if you don't think it's happening, I can tell you that it is because somebody knows the password to Wi-Fi. And so all of a sudden somebody's Apple Watch is now on your network or whatever that might be. That shadow IT, it's happening right now. Um, and, and there are a couple of reasons why it happens. Number one uh, is because we might not be keeping up with someone's needs or expectations, or someone might have uh, other needs and expectations that we aren't aware of, and they try to do that. The best thing I say from shadow IT is to learn from it, as in how can we better support our team so that they don't have to resort to doing things in the shadows. Uh, you remember that fish tank thermometer hole issue about the casino hack? Internet of Things and shadow IT, because it probably was not a, an approved thing to do. Here are some of the places where shadow IT can really impact us. Um, wireless thermostats, we're moving into a new building here in Oklahoma City, uh, and we wanna have a thermostat control system, um, but we don't want it on the same wireless network as the rest of our information. So we're having to do some things uh, to work with that. But this is just a myriad of devices um, that are potential entry points for attacks into your systems um, that are from this shadow IT and the internet of things. How about what's going on? Do you know what's going on? Do you have reliable systems that look for network intrusions, that look for data exfiltration, that look for uh, any variety of things, you know, um, command and control systems that are phoning home and getting ready to launch a ransomware attack inside of your inside of your network. Do you have systems in place for looking at that? Do you have systems in place for monitoring email? Do you have systems in place for protecting those things? And how do you know what's being blocked, what's being stopped, what's being allowed, things like that. So that internet of things on your network if you have good remote monitoring and you have good controls in place, then you might know what's going on. Cloud's another thing. Do you have controls around your cloud computing? I mean, Office 365 is a, is a huge deal and we use the heck out of Teams and OneDrive and everything, but do you have those data exfiltration um, policy set up so that you know when people share data outside of the organization? If you don't, you probably need to figure out what's going on. And last but not least, it just takes one. Uh, and this really is the thing that keeps me up at night, wakes me up early in the mornings. It's because you are potentially one click away from a really, really bad day. Uh, and that is uh, whatever it might be, you know, whether it's somebody, crazily enough, downloads a screensaver that then introduces ransomware to your network and takes out your entire network and puts your city in the dark. It could be a link in a file could be a link in an email, could be a malicious piece of software, could be any number of things. Always remember, you can have all the security in the world, but still, it only takes one. It takes one smart person. It takes one person not thinking about it, not doing the right thing. And we have had examples of that over and over here. Um, fortunately, we're, we have a culture of people who say, yes, I did that. That was my fault. I should know better. So we can go in and correct those things. But what happens when you don't have someone realize what they do? It only takes one. You are potentially one click away from that. So the thing I want you to understand is, is that, that 
these are all things that keep me up at night. But most importantly, this picture in the bottom right hand corner, besides being quite humorous, it should not be the way that your EMS agency looks at cybersecurity. That is not the appropriate response to how we want to protect the assets that we have. Um, takes one, takes one bad actor can can take out years of proper planning and and appropriate cybersecurity methods. So always, 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 always think about security. Okay, I think I'm on deck and uh, good morning from California. Good afternoon if you are on the uh, left coast and hopefully my screen share. Can somebody just confirm I'm up on the screen share? Not yet, Rob. Not okay. yet, Rob. Thank you. How's that? Thank goodness that was the right screen. Thank goodness it was the right screen. And I just want to kind of segue over from what uh, Frank was just talking about. Obviously, all eyes are on Ukraine today. and They have been for the last uh, few weeks. And one of the things that happened in the news yesterday was a massive cyber attack on the Ukrainian banking system and the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense system. And obviously, there's a lot of cyber activity going on. Uh, two weeks ago, I uh, helped uh, our friends at First Watch put out a podcast uh, where this uh, both Mike Tegman, who's going to come up later, and he might want to talk about this uh, a little bit later on, and also cybersecurity expert from First Watch, Bill Ott, talked about the, the cyber risk that uh, we are uh, seeing and experiencing right now. And so, you know, just to re reaffirm what Frank has already said, that the threat right now is exceptionally real. And uh, Amanda, I will put in the notes a link to that to that podcast where uh, Bill Ott listed some of the, again, yet more practical tips uh, and reminders uh, of what uh, we should be doing right now in this uh, high risk uh, cyber world that we live in. Uh, I'm going to talk two things very briefly today. And uh, first of all, data, as uh, Matt uh, well knows, that uh, data is my favorite four letter word. However, I was chatting to Dr. Remley Crow the other day, and uh, she has two favorite four letter words. One is data, and the other one is taco. And actually, what I discovered is that there is actually data on tacos. If you follow her presentations, they're all there for you to follow. So in terms of uh, not taking up too much time, I just really wanted to talk about one key data uh, source that's, that's freely available, available to everybody. And, and uh, that is the Nemesis uh, by the numbers charts that are actually published weekly. And if you just Google Nemesis EMS by the numbers, what it does is actually gives you all a quick snapshot of where we've been over the last four years from over 100 million records Obviously, you fill in your EPCR, that goes through state data, that state data then goes up to Nemesis. And from a briefing and a political perspective, it enables you to use that data very much to uh, influence uh, and to brief those that are around you. And the chart that you can see in front of you right now is actually a four-year look at APOT, ambulance patient offload time, ramp time, war time, uh, hospital bed delay, ambulance delay, whatever you want to call it. And as I always like to say, the picture there paints a thousand words and those thousand words, well, those few words are, look what's just happened during the pandemic. And obviously it is something that uh, continues to give us cause, continues to give us cause for concern. And actually I'm sitting down with uh, uh, Wolfberg and Worth on Friday to have a deeper dive into uh, ambulance delays. And so again, my first top tip and takeaway, if you like, is that there's a very free source of immediate information via Nemesis that really gives you some cool stuff to actually use for briefing, uh, you know, your elected officials and others. The other online opportunity that's coming along and uh, from a from an information, from an education perspective, of course, is that of EMT training. And we know from we've got NAMT and, and Matt and co have uh, EMS on the Hill coming up, virtual EMS on the Hill coming up. Uh, we have a number of legislative and collaborative uh, initiatives going on around getting funding, getting support, getting recognition uh, for EMS training. And obviously it's becoming a challenge right now in terms of, uh, in terms of, the act, in terms of just getting people in the door. Um, interestingly, as an aside, one of the things we discussed yesterday in the group I was in that all of the bonuses that we're paying people to come and work for us are having no effect whatsoever because you lose one, you gain one, the net gain is zero. And so uh, it's, it's an interesting one. So 
the thing that we need to realize is that uh, distributive education is actually the thing of the week, the thing of the year, because of where we've been with the pandemic. Uh, our friends at the National Registry uh, have removed the limits for distributive education. What does that mean? It means that you can get your folk that have been through the pandemic, that have been on the tip of the spear, actually recertified online uh, quickly. Now, of course, a lot of those folk are on the March the 31st, 2022. In other words, just over six weeks away uh, from recertification. And so, uh, I certainly discovered in my days as a, as, a, as a COO in various parts of the US where on the day of uh, certification expiry, people would come in acting surprised that their certificates had expired. And so, you know, despite the countdowns, despite everything else that's going on, then, of course, we just need to make sure that your folk are recertified. And uh, a little bit of a plug, there are lots of learning management systems out there right now that can get you online and actually uh, get your folk recertified. Um, now, of course, this also leads into continuing education training, also leads into virtual onboarding and uh, learning management systems can actually load up uh, lessons, lectures uh, for you. And actually, this is a, just a photograph of uh, the, the Prodigy team up in uh, Cambridge with our Centre for Medics actually filming, as you can see, it's some Stop the Bleed, um, pretty traumatic Stop the Bleed uh, activity going on. Also, learning management systems have the ability to actually allow you to have a virtual classroom. And so uh, back in Massachusetts, there is actually a virtual uh, catalogue of classes that you can tune in at any time. And so because of the distributive limit, uh, you know, the, the distributive, distributive limit has gone away, then, of course, you can sort of tune in to classes such as this. Um, obviously, look for a learning management system uh, with a, with a catalogue of events that give free CE. Uh, and of course, uh, my home team does that very elegantly. Um, and also just a quick plug for if you have folk out there that are on the 31st of March distribution or the 31st of March expiry, um, there is a lot of free CE going on right now. And there's still time for people to get their CE in. There's still time for them not to claim that on the day that expires that they forgot about it. Uh, and uh, if you haven't visited Refresh 2021, it's totally free. Uh, 20, uh, 30 hours of NCCR uh, education. And so I commend a folk to do that, get your people on there, uh, time is running out. Uh, and just as an illustration of that, uh, so far we have delivered a free 900,000 hours of education. So data takeaways, um, use the Nemesis for briefing your elected officials, powerful graphs, don't have to do too much to extract the data. Remember that the uh, distributive limits expire or well, currently on the 31st of March. Uh, so get, you, get your folk through and uh, happy to take questions at the end. And I'm going to hand it back to you all uh, over there in the studio. Thanks, Rob. I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to be taking the ball from you here. I'm going to be doing the same thing, sharing my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the screen. We're good to go. So, um, you know, we've had some great topics so far. The, the next thing we want to talk about is using technology and how do we can use it to, to do things like engage our employees, especially given the challenges we have with employee turnover um, and the ability to retain and recruit. Um, lots of challenges there. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about some things you can use to, to hopefully try to improve your engagement and retention. And then talk a little bit about, um, philosophically, I guess, where things seem to be going when it associated with um, EMS software um, and EMS-based uh, software versus software-based EMS agencies. A little bit, a bit more about our organization for some background. Uh, we've been around since 93. We do lots of different things here. We're part of a large health system in New York City. We do over, up, coming up now to over 200,000 calls a year. Um, we're a triple accredited agency. And one of the things I want to highlight is that our value is driven by our people, fortified by technology. Um, it's not the technology that makes us uh, successful. So one of the things that AIM High talks quite a bit about is this concept of high value or high performance EMS, right? And if you've looked through some of the periodicals that are out there, uh, there's been lot, lots of articles that AIM High has been working on from an educational standpoint to talk more about high value EMS. And this is an article 
uh, Doug Hooten and I did a while back, talking about the EMS success triad, and it comes down to these three things, patient care, employee well-being, and long-term financial sustainability. And most of us as EMS organizations, especially high-performance ones, have done really good on about two of these three prongs, the patient care side and the the long-term financial sustainability side. But I think what we're finding and what the you know the pandemic clearly is uh, draining the water around the iceberg around is our ability to engage and retain our employees and, and it's an area of weakness for us. One of the things a better way to describe this is this concept of a smart versus sulfur organization and you, you honestly need to be both. And many of us in high performance or high value systems um, are very smart in terms of how we run the business. And we, we do a lot of good things here as you can see on the on the list in front of you, but um, you know, are we in, you know, the most sulfur organization. And what do we mean by that? Um, well, it really comes down to how do we engage our staff? How do we engage our employees? Um, you know, there's been a lot more work done on the concept of resilience for our staff, but there's a lot more to it than that. And, and really, I think it comes down to, to um, embracing um, a couple of things that we've learned using data and uh, technology to help us better understand where our faults are so that we can go and um, fix our problems. Um, as we know, our, our, my favorite person, Dr. Deming, says what you can't uh, measure, you can't manage. And that really holds true for employee engagement and culture within your organization. And so one of the things we embraced, uh, well, actually, we were kind of forced to embrace kicking and screaming back in 2012 was this concept of employee engagement surveys. It's something healthcare is very much uh, doing and has been doing for quite some time. And because we're part of a large health system-based organization, um, we started this process. And um, when we first measured ourselves, uh, we were actually the lowest out of uh, the entire organization. And we're a very large organization, 75,000 employees, 23 hospitals, um, and it uh, wasn't the best place to be um, you know, at the, at the very bottom of the uh, engagement survey. And so, but more importantly, what that survey did was give us an insight in, uh, of data, right, into what were our problems associated with engagement. And Press Ganey has a really nice system put together. There's many systems out there. Um, there are some that are specific to EMS that you can use to um, survey your employees, hopefully just, just like you survey your patients to find out how your customer satisfaction is doing. You should also be surveying your employees to see how your leadership team and your organization is doing. And what we found, my guess is we would probably find as common denominators for most EMS organizations. And that's one, we're a geographically dispersed organization that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? And because of that, that presents a lot of challenges associated with communicating with our team, engaging with our team, seeing our team, being able to interact with our team. And you know, some of the things that we have to recognize as leaders is, you know, there's a significant, um, most of us have uh, many different generations working within our organization. Many of our leaders are probably boomers. The, the middle management is Xers and those in the field, um, you know, can be uh, millennials or, or Zers or Xers um, oftentimes. So understanding, you know, the cultural differences between the generations is something we didn't fully appreciate and, and had to learn about. And then the other challenge we always struggle with is span of control on EMS, right? And, and how many people report to how many folks. And then finally, leadership in, uh, you know, where our, um, our gaps were in our leadership team. And here we have uh, the Lisione Pyramid um, that was introduced to us by, uh, by Dr. Becknell, um, and um, who's a, a, a psychologist we brought in to help us, uh, an industrial psychologist we brought in to help us uh, with our leadership team and our leadership growth. So once we kind of understood where our problems were, you know, the next thing was how do we improve it? And we very much follow improvement science-based approach, PDSA cycles, uh, in terms of wanting to improve things. And believe it or not, you can turn culture and engagement into a PDSA or into a, into a project for improvement. Um, and we, we focused on three different domains, employee, manager, and organization. Um, and what we learned, again, um, was uh, one, we had to learn to lead, right? Um, we had uh, a, a deficit in our management team and our leadership team in terms of our support of them in terms of um, you know, making sure they have the skills to be good leaders. Um, and so the healthcare system that we work with, again, has a lot of um, uh, opportunities, I guess, to, for our uh, leadership team to learn, as well as we brought in, like I mentioned, uh, an industrial psychologist to help us better get our arms around some of these things, and, and especially some of the things that were important are emotional intelligence, the use of uh, personality. Uh, Myers-Briggs is a great example. There's also a... Um, um, 
a, a, a Facebook meme out there right now, I believe, on a person analysis or a large chain going on about person analysis from back in the life fleet days for those who were around. Um, I'm a red, a red blue person, um, which is a decision maker and, and then making lots of data kind of thing. So learning more about personalities and how they interact with each other is also important. When it comes to technology, um, you know, to fill this communication gap, the use of neural communication tools is really something that uh, is a game changer. And it was for us in terms of how we communicate with our team, how our team communicates with us. And we embraced um, Facebook Workplace very early on. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to go learn more about it. Um, and it allows us essentially to kind of have our own, um, you know, hosted um, um, Facebook, um, essentially, uh, website that our teams can go to, and it's 100% controlled, um, you know, and it's encapsulated, so uh, it's not not open to the public uh, per se. And um, we use it; it's a moderated tool that we use um, with a set of rules, just like most, you know, internet chats uh, 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 groups have. And it's been, like I said, it's, it's given us a tremendous amount of value because it allows us to do many different things. Just like we're doing right now, we're broadcasting live on Facebook. Um, we actually broadcast live on Facebook within um, Workplace um, to our employees. And uh, our leadership team have like weekly uh, broadcasts that we do. Our, our executive leadership team, um, we do on a quarterly basis and we answer questions. And it's, it's just been an amazing transformative tool. Same thing Frank mentioned earlier, Slack or Teams also um, extremely transformative for us and, and giving us a lot of uh, opportunities to share information and be radically transparent, as well as engage our employees in terms of their ability to um, participate in, in different aspects of the organization. The results, I think, speak for themselves. There's a lot more to it than we have for 10 minutes. Um, and, and there's been a large return on investment for us. Um, and, um, you know, it, this is a long-term investment. It's not a short-term thing. Um, but it's definitely something you should focus on for improving uh, retention and, and engagement because culture, you know, hopefully helps you to be a workplace people want to come to and not leave. So um, very quickly, we'll talk about the use of software and the shift we're seeing. Um, I like to kind of talk about this concept of EMS-based software versus software-based EMS. And on the left side of the screen is kind of where we, 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 we are coming from in terms of EMS and how we use software. You know, software is used as a supplement on top of our existing traditional business processes. Um, we oftentimes have to have trade-offs associated with its ad adoption, whereas well, we're starting to see this interesting um, area um, in EMS evolve associated with um, you know, software that's driven or drives the EMS agency and is purpose built from the ground up uh, around optimized business processes that help uh, drive uh, a very different approach, as you can see, kind of revolutionary versus evolutionary change in how organizations are run and, and perform the, their duties as EMS agencies. Um, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, we have an EMS is it's trying to make any form of change is like trying to drive a car going 60 miles an hour, and it's always easier to build something from scratch versus not. And so that's some of the benefits that we're seeing with people that are building this purpose-built built, uh, software. Um, many pre-existing EMS agencies use existing software or kind of come into this term of build or buy. And um, buying software, you know, is, is what we've traditionally done, and it yields certain desired um, workflow changes and value, but also there's a lot of trade-offs sometimes. And so what we're seeing happen is a lot of EMS agencies uh, look to the concept of building their own solution and, and building their own software. And of course, how hard can it be? Well, I can tell you it's very hard. Um, we do it here at Northwell. We've got an amazing team where we build a lot of our own software um, to help us um, from a purpose-built perspective, help us be nimble and do some of the things that we do. And you basically have to know how to run a software company um, in order to build your own software. That's kind of the, the piece here. Um, it's that great debate, build or buy. Um, I know many of my friends in the uh, software industry say if it were easy, everybody would do it. But what we are seeing is uh, the prevalence of the ability to, to make software is becoming easier, um, and we see a lot more software engineers that are available out there. So this is becoming more reachable, especially for larger EMS agencies. Finally, um, again, I'll end with Deming, but I'm going to add some WashGo to the Deming, is that each system or culture is perfectly designed to intentionally or unintentionally give you exactly what you are getting mm -hmm. today. So I will hand, take that off and hand that over to um, Mr. Tagman. Thank you, John. And uh, I, I don't know how many of you um, had a, uh, a sound of uh, James Brown in the background uh, when uh, uh, John was talking about a soulful uh, EMS system that certainly uh, 
certainly popped up for me. And um, um, I, I also appreciate the, uh, uh, the slide with the, the toilet paper roll and um, that the A or B, uh, which, which is it. I actually uh, found the original patent uh, for the toilet paper roll and it, it, uh, it shows it uh, coming down from underneath. Um, but I think that was uh, patented by somebody who does not have uh, kids or cats. Um, because if you put it on that way, you're going to end up with uh, all kinds of all kinds of piles of toilet paper in different spots. Uh, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and uh, and talk about um, kind of how the tofu gets made when it comes to to thinking about data analytics and how it how it's useful um, in your in your organization. So my disclosures are: I do work for uh, First Watch, uh, one of those software companies that uh, that John referred to, and uh, and teach at a couple of places. Um, when you when you stand back and think about quality related stuff in EMS, whether it's you know people talk about quality assurance and quality improvement as if they use the terms as if they're interchangeable, and and we have a lineage of doing all kinds of quality related things um, in in EMS organizations all across the world. Um, but when you show up to visit them and uh, ask a question, so God, you've got all this great quality stuff. What have you actually made better? Um, you tend to get kind of an owl-eyed stare about, you know, but, but we're reviewing a lot of charts, but, you know, we've got peer review, but we've got committees, um, but they haven't been able to actually uh, show any improvement. So uh, when, I, when I think about uh, quality management, I, I think about three buckets of activity. The first one is kind of the vital signs of your organization. Um, how, do you, how do you monitor your performance um, and the health of your organization? Uh, and all of those uh, domains like have been uh, talked about here. So you want to have some sense of how you're doing financially, what your clinical performance looks like, the health and happiness of your, uh, your workforce and team, reliability of your fleet, uh, your supply chain, those kinds of things. Um, and you also want to have a, a bucket of things that you're actually working to make better, that you're intentionally working to make better. And last, a little bucket that deals with uh, complaints and investigations. Um, which um, are the Sentinel events, kind of the one-off things that, uh, that people need to, need to focus on. So when it comes to uh, thinking about how do you, how do you organize, uh, starting with the, the, the vital signs, um, in most organizations, there's somebody who has got uh, the letter Q in their, in their job title, whose job it is to look at um, all the calls that you're running and say, uh, you know, are we, are we doing what we intend to do for our patients? Um, and I was, I was actually just on a, a call with a, a friend who's in a, a large EMS system working on uh, improving their cardiac arrest resuscitation rate, which is significantly below what they think it could be. And um, we, were, we were talking about the, the concept of pit crew CPR. And he says, you know, we've got, we've got, pit crew CPR in our protocols. And I said, that's great, how does it work? And he's, I'm, I'm not really sure. And um, so it's like, not, not, not really sure. And so they went and, and, and did some looking at it and, and their, the protocol for their approach to resuscitation has got just huge variation between how people do it. Um, and, and consequently, they're, they're producing kind of mediocre results. So what, what folks end up doing is it's like, how, you know, are, are we doing what we intend to do? So for, for example, if I was in your EMS system, any of you who are participating in the session today, and as a 62-year-old, somewhat, somewhat obese uh, male who uh, spends uh, too much time sitting in a chair on webinars and Zoom these days, um, if I, my anterior descending coronary artery closed up and caused me to have chest pain in your neck of the woods, um, there's probably a bundle of care that you would expect I would get. And this may not be right in your organization, but in a lot of places it includes, you know, getting aspirin or documentation that you're allergic to aspirin, uh, making sure I get a, a 12 lead quickly, um, my oxygen saturation, uh, I, I, if it's low, I get oxygen. If I, it's okay, I don't get oxygen. Uh, nitro, pain managed effectively, notification if I have a STEMI. Um, so from a, from a data analytics uh, perspective and a technology perspective, you can kind of take that criteria, program it into the, into the computer 
and and analyze the the data based on what's in your electronic medical record and do some kind of initial initial sorting um, and looking at your calls of you know if I got all of the things I was supposed to get got my aspirin got my nitro you know got my uh, STEMI alert so that the receiving cardiac interventional facility could clear off the elective uh, people from the, the cath lab table and put me in there to poke a, a wire through my clot and uh, inflate a balloon and place a stent. Um, I would get uh, categorized up here in the, in the green bucket, but if, if something was missed, I'd get flagged uh, for, a, for a human being to review because the computers can't yet uh, do everything that, that humans can do. So when a, a human looks at it, you may uh, look at it and say, you know, um, this, uh, this patient is a Christian scientist who refuses all medications. So the fact that aspirin wasn't given um, is, is acceptable and we couldn't pick that up out of the narrative from the computer system. So we move it into the, the pass bucket um, or um, say, you know, there's nothing I can tell on here why this patient didn't get aspirin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to investigate what happened here, maybe uh, take a look at the performance history for the medic that's involved and uh, um, uh, see if, uh, if she's somebody who, uh, you know, the last 100 uh, acute coronary syndrome patients she ran, she gave aspirin or documented allergy. So this is a one-off I'm not too worried about, or only 50 out of the 100 say anything about aspirin. So we need to, to have a little performance improvement conversation however that works in your system. And basically you kind of grab uh, the, the analytics uh, from uh, these results and plot them on performance over time charts uh, to look and see how, how are we doing from a large, large system perspective. So um, this, is a, this is an example of uh, real performance from a system that shall remain nameless of um, uh, their, their bundled care for their acute coronary syndrome patients. So each dot represents the percentage of their patients that got the complete bundle of care each month. And uh, th this is on a, a statistical process control chart. It's a, <clears throat> an eye chart. And um, you'll see that there's some variation, but they were running along about 85% performance. And then here they've plummeted. So it's like, what's going on? So your, your analytics should be able to help you kind of diagnose what's happening. Um, and look at all the, the things that make up this bundle of care. We'll look at them individually here. So the, the 12 lead documentation looks like it's fallen off a little bit toward the end. Um, aspirin uh, administered in the narrative looks like they, they rock that in the 95% range generally. Um, nitro administration, if their blood pressure is over 100, um, has generally been pretty good, a little bit of a drop off toward the last, uh, last couple of months. Hospital activation, if they're a STEMI patient, is uh, staying at 100%. Um, their final pain um, score is less than their initial pain score, has dropped off significantly from running just under 90% to around 60% now. And um, if they're uh, over 35, was their pain treated with morphine, has dropped down to, to 60%. So you can pretty pretty quickly um, kind of uh, look, look through this and say, you know, um, the, the biggest contributor for our drop off here has to do with pain management. So, let, you know, let's go talk with the people who kind of manage our, our system and process and find out what's, what's, what's happening. And lo and behold, the system discovered that because of uh, supply chain issues, they've not been able to uh, get adequate amounts of morphine. So people are or holding it back, trying to save it for the people who are in the greatest number of pain. Um, so the cause for this is really a supply chain issue, um, which uh, probably won't by, be helped by doing chart review and uh, spanking and punishing medics who don't uh, meet your, uh, your standard of performance, um, that uh, the system really has a, a system and process issue that is uh, the primary cause of the challenges uh, so that the intervention should be uh, process and um, protocol kind of oriented. Um, and, and when you stand back and look at data, about 95% of uh, performance issues um, in EMS systems uh, actually have a, a process related solution as opposed to uh, the history of, of coaching individuals. Um, so with that, I will wrap up my section and turn it over to Pete. 
All right, thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, everybody able to see right source in your EMS IT department? All right. Uh, Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, I am you've Pete Rizzo. It. Pete, yep. you might want to flip your screens. You've got it on, on uh, presenter view. Okay. How's that? Still presenter view or did I do it right this time? Mucho better, sir. Okay, well, awesome. Uh, I am Pete Rizzo. I've led the information technology department at MedStar since 2017. And today I am thrilled and mildly terrified to talk to you about right sourcing. So what is right sourcing? Right sourcing is a term I use to talk about leveraging the best sources to deliver the capabilities that your organization needs and realizing that the best source isn't always doing everything in-house. Um, we're probably all already doing this in our organizations today outside of IT. Um, for example, unless you're building your own ambulances or making your own pharmaceuticals, you're using a better source uh, for that. So I'll be talking about how we've applied the right sourcing concept to our IT department and why you might choose to take a look at your IT sourcing model. So we'll start with a quick overview of MedStar. I'll show you a model that non-technical leaders can use to determine where your IT capabilities are versus where they could be. Uh, we'll touch on MedStar's journey to, from a completely in-house IT department to a right source model. I'll show you some of the metrics I use really quick, I promise, to uh, manage our IT operations. Uh, we'll go through some of the major benefits we've realized since moving to a right source model. And finally, I'll describe some lessons that we learned as we went through the process. Okay, I won't read this slide, but I'll just wanna add that we support three facilities, over 100 office users, 150 end user devices, 85 network vehicles, 250 field mobile devices, uh, 80 servers and four networks. And I'd also point out that as a public utility model, we're a standalone entity. So I don't have a city or a hospital IT staff available to augment capabilities that I can't deliver in house. Okay, so here's the simple IT maturity model. I didn't invent this model. I did what any IT guy worth his salt did. I stole it from several sources, simplified it, and adapted it so that you don't have to be an IT insider to assess where your IT organization fits. Uh, this model has four tiers, with tier zero being the least mature and tier three being the most. Um, tier zero is unmanaged IT. And the characteristics of that is you don't have any metrics, no baselines, no measures of customer satisfaction, and no standard processes. You prioritize what you do by whoever's screaming the loudest. Uh, your production outages are frequent and lengthy. Um, and we learn about issues usually from our users. And I would just point out that turnover can be devastating at level zero because the knowledge is kept at the individual level rather than the organizational. At tier one, you have documented SOPs. You've got a consistent call handling and prioritization procedure, but you're still fixing the same issue multiple times. Uh, and while you still may be having frequent outages, they tend to be shorter in duration. At this tier, the IT department is skilled at responding to emergencies. And because of that, this is where EMS IT departments can sometimes stop. Um, I think that's kind of where MedStar stopped when I came on because it matches the model for the rest of the organization, but we can run IT better. So when you move to tier two, you're finding and removing root causes. You've got appropriate metrics in place. You understand your costs and your ROI and your outages are both rare and brief. At tier three, the IT team is proactive and looking for alignment with the organization's mission. And we're always looking for ways to leverage technology to make life easier for the other departments. IT is viewed as a trusted advisor with a seat at the table as the organization seeks to solve hard problems. And I would just point out about this model that as the organization progresses upward from tier zero, um, customer satisfaction tends to increase and um, operational costs tend to decrease. When I onboarded at MedStar, I think we were at 
tier one kind of drifting down to tier zero just because the manager position had been vacant for a while when I came on. Um, today, we're at tier three in most areas. And one of our primary goals, of course, is to bring the remaining areas up to that tier. And we got to where we are now chiefly, chiefly by changing our sourcing model. So this slide shows several mission critical systems, how we sourced them in 2017 and how we source them today. As you can see in 2017, we managed everything in house and today almost nothing is hosted at our site. Um, in some respects, the decision to move away from an on-premises self-managed strategy was a no-brainer for us. Uh, our headquarters happens to be um, a few hundred yards away from the end of a very active military runway. So we were one bad landing away from being a crater, not probably not a great place to have all your technology. And the other thing I point out on this slide is that by lever leveraging a managed services provider, we reduced our internal IT staff from six down to two. Uh, why I don't do live demos. I thought about doing a live demo of my metrics dashboard, but then I remembered a recent live demo of Tesla's, uh, the Tesla Cybertruck's unbreakable windows. And if you didn't see it, that's how it went. So let's look at some screenshots instead. Uh, this slide might be a little hard to read, but the only point is that across the top, I can see the number of open tickets at any time the average time to resolution across all tickets and the number and percentage of tickets that are waiting on MedStar to take action. And I can click and drill, drill down on any of these. Uh, another metric I check often is who are the most active users. This shows me who's opening the most help desk tickets. And the thing to note here is that the tallest bar to the far left represents tickets that are opened, in, opened by automated monitoring. And this indicates that we're finding the majority of issues before they have a user impact. Um, yeah, and then once again, I can drill down into these and see the tickets that each person's op uh, opening and that helps me identify trends. And my only point showing these pretty pie graphs is that I do use graphic depictions of the types of tickets that are being opened. And again, I can drill down and see individual issues that make up any of the slices. Okay, here are some of the main benefits we realized as we moved from a right sourced model, uh, as we moved to a right source model and a more mature IT organization, uh, lower operational costs. We lowered our operational costs once at the beginning from day one when we moved from a staff of six down to two, even factoring in the cost of the managed services provider. Um, and we did that primarily through attrition. We didn't need to do layoffs uh, and the, the managed service provider hired one of our people as well. Um, two years later, once we had removed many of the major problems from uh, the infrastructure, we were able to renegotiate our MSP contract and lower the costs again. Uh, increased customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction was running around 80% when we first baselined it. And frankly, I think that was pretty generous. Uh, but now it stays above 90% consistently. Uh, unreported, fewer unreported issues. So we can't fix issues we don't know about. Now that the users know that they'll get a timely and helpful response, they're opening more help, help desk tickets rather than just living with issues. Also calling or emailing the help desk is probably, probably more comfortable for users than waking up IT staff in the middle of the night. Uh, higher confidence in IT means that when I spend time with our executive team, uh, I'm not getting their input on how to fix my operational issues, but they're providing me with strategic guidance on how IT can better support the organization's mission. And uh, since I spend less time on operations, I have more time to focus on projects and giving talks to AIM High. So what did we learn as we went through this? Um, getting executive support first. Uh, we had ex strong executive support from the beginning, which was critical. Um, people are resistant to change. And if your IT department isn't viewed as a trusted advisor, that adds extra resistance. So if you frame it as a leadership decision, it helps tremendously with adoption. Uh, also with the costs that are involved in moving to this model, you know, the startup costs that it may need to be presented to your board. And so it's vital that the executive team understands what you're doing and why. Uh, vet your vendors thoroughly. Um, we not only did an RFP and checked references, but the thing that really helped us was we had the top vendors give on-site presentations. And we learned through that, that some people who really talked a good game in their proposal were not gonna be able to execute. 
Um, outsourcing contracts need active management. I have weekly operational meetings with all of our key sourcing partners, and I usually spend about 10 to 25% of my week managing those vendors. SLAs are key. Uh, just like any contract, they make sure you can get out of it if it's not meeting your needs. Uh, for example, we could get out of our managed services contract if our, um, our managed service provider contract, if we had two extended CAD down events in a one-year period. Um, our, our current sourcing vendor relationships are all really good, but it would definitely be a red flag if uh, I was looking for, at the SLAs every day, and it would be a huge red flag if the executive leadership was asking me about the contracts. Uh, prepare for loss of control. It was definitely an adjustment to have most of our support remote. Uh, I was used to just walking down the hall and changing staff priorities, and you can't do that with outsourced functions. Until I made that mindset, mindset shift, it was really frustrating. Uh, maintain an in-house staff. We, find, we found that we needed two IT employees, one me to manage the outsourcing contract and the projects, and one to respond to the immediate needs for hands-on responses. So in conclusion, uh, we found that right sourcing did have an immediate positive impact on our capabilities, but it's definitely been a process of continuous improvement that's ongoing even after almost five years. Thanks for your time and attention, and I will turn it back to Matt. Pete, thank you very much. And I, you know, we had said this in the beginning, but hopefully people were capturing those Pete-isms. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, Pete did a great job. Everybody did a super job. So we're going to ask our cast of character, I'm sorry, I mean our um, tech and information system experts to uh, come back to the, to the full view so that we can do a little bit of a panel discussion with them um, regarding some of the questions that we had gotten in the beginning, but also um, some questions that you may have that come in through the Q&A section. And thank you to Amanda for monitoring that for us because that is really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, kudos to Amanda. Did you catch her double bubble uh, tongue twister that she said in the very beginning? Uh, we're gonna have to go back and watch the video just to, to really practice that. She did a great job talking about the double bubble, was absolutely blown away. All right, so the first question that we wanna pose to the panel is how do you know if an investment that you are going to make in technology is gonna be really worth the investment. So uh, Frank, we'll start with you. Uh, you've been with EMSA for a long time and I'm sure that people bring or you discover the latest, greatest technology thing that you're gonna do. What sort of process do you go through to determine if it's gonna be worth the investment in that, in that technology enhancement? Well, a great question, Matt. Uh, and the first, the first thing is that we're not even evaluating solutions until we understand what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Uh, I talk about um, this time and time again when I, when I teach uh, at ASM and everything. If you don't spend time understanding what the problem is and understand exactly what it is and so you can define it and then you can understand if there is a solution, how you would use that solution to solve the problem, um, then you're just buying cool things to buy cool things. And if you think you're doing something other than that, you are flat out kidding yourself. So, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm guilty of this as probably everybody else on this call is uh, at some point in time. Uh, but really solutions start with understanding the problem and not going to look for solutions. We don't do solution shopping here. Great. And Jonathan, you're, you're part of a huge organization and, I'm, and you are very technology driven, but with a very specific purpose. How would you answer this question? I think very similar to Frank, you know, we start with the end in mind, trying to understand what's the problem we're, we're trying to solve for, and then look to the marketplace to see what solutions are out there. And uh, as I mentioned in uh, the talk, you know, oftentimes there's trade-offs you have to make uh, in order to get the value proposition. And so you need to understand what those trade-offs are, the short, the medium, long-term expenses, and then do that kind of buy or, buy or build assessment, right? Um, like I said, we're fortunate enough to be large enough where we have our own software engineering team. And so we, we oftentimes will look, do we build or do we buy? And what we find more and more is we've been building because the solutions that are out there would force us to take on a different workflow or not allow us to be nimble enough or not have the functions and the features that we need in order to uh, you know, achieve the goal we're trying to achieve the way we want to versus the way the software vendor wants us to do it. And so, uh, you know, that, that's, 
those are some of the lessons we've learned. Yeah, you know, we just had that conversation here at MedStar this morning where we went to a new HRIS package and uh, we believed the salespeople, right? And just checked references and then- <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. bad. Never, yeah. It's Number never, one mistake. Yeah. Think it's the salespeople thing. are always in it for you, the customer. <laughs> and, and they're always right. right. You know, I mean, that's been our experience. Um, but, you know, we just got a great question in from Michael Courtney and I'm going to direct this one to Pete. Because uh, Pete, you've worked, even before you came to MedStar, you worked for very large organizations that we probably can't say because we'd have to pay them because we said their name, but also some uh, other types of organizations. So the question for Michael is, what would you suggest for IT services for a small agency? So if you've got a, a small organization, what are some of those initial IT systems that you should have in place that you should um, really work on first? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that if I, MedStar is kind of in the middle. We're, we're kind of too big to be small and too small to be big. So this, this a little bit, I think, does apply to us. But um, the way that I, I would assess it going into any place and especially a small place is, is what are you good at? Um, and what are you not good at? And where are your pain points? And, you know, just kind of start with, um, the things that you're not good at and that you don't have any, any clear path to becoming good at and, and start with those um, and, and then prioritize those by what are the most critical to supporting the organization's mission. Great question. And Mike, I'm going to, Mike Tegman, I'm going to ask you the same question because you, through your affiliation with First Watch, work with huge agencies, small agencies, um, and, and certainly in the quality space, how would you answer that question? You know, very similar to what every, everybody else has said. You got to try to figure out either what problem you're trying to solve, what opportunity you're trying to take advantage of, um, and, and, and kind of standing back because what, what tends to happen is because most of us have taken, you know, 15,000 multiple choice tests by the time we're in, in our 20s, um, we we have this kind of mental impulse to once we get a solution, that's the right answer and we stop there. And so what, what we really encourage is let's, let's think about five or six other ways that you might be able to wrap your arms around this. And oftentimes you can find something that is you know, faster, cheaper. Uh, you can kind of address the issue or concern you've got with the stuff you've already got. Um, so really, really kind of expanding your number of of solutions um, so that you can kind of evaluate those and, and then take a look and say, which of these is, you know, there's cost factors, there's the amount of work associated with it factors, there's reliability factors, there's, you know, is this something I can do a really small test on rather than, you know, when you, when you go you know, change your CAD system, it's hard to like do a little, I'm going to, I'm going to just test this new CAD just on two calls to see how it works. It, it doesn't, doesn't doesn't necessarily work like that, but um, look looking for solutions that uh, do what you want to do um, are not too much work and are not too expensive is usually a, a model that I tend to think through. Awesome, thanks, Mike. We've got one question that's come from the audience, but I want to put this one up on the screen and we'll get your opinion on uh, your answers on on this one. Then I want to go back to Dwayne's question. Um, lo looking through your binoculars, uh, what are the big tech trends that you're going to see? five years from now. And Rob, despite your, peach, your speech impediment, let's ask you to maybe first answer this question. I think it's got to be the re-engineering of how pre-hospital services are delivered and more and more and more uh, wearables, more and more and more emphasis on telemedicine and more and more and more technology solutions to um, conduct what I used to call not admission, not, not admission avoidance but arrival avoidance, in other words, keeping the patient away from the hospital and getting them down the appropriate pathway. We're starting to see that now. Obviously, the pandemic has helped us along in getting into the mindset that we need to do something different. I think that, uh, and again, there are more and more techno technological innovations. There are actually a lot of tech companies actually taking over ambulance operations as well. And so therefore, we are already seeing the merger of these two things. And so I think that's what's coming along now. And, uh, you know, and I think all of these things we, we talked about and Mike worked on, you know, EMS 2050. Well, I think the pandemic kind of dragged 2050 towards us. And so we're now looking for those tech solutions 
um, to get us out of the current mess that we're in. Um, you know, we rented an aircraft carrier yesterday in California with mission accomplished, masks are now off. And, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has turned into endemic, but actually, I don't think so. And I think we have to have these these tech solutions will probably help the patient. If you're in steam driven ambulance services, it may not help us. We may have to re-engineer, redesign and rethink how we do business going forward, Matt. Uh, Mike Tagman, Rob tagged you. Um, so Tag you're, Mike. You're, <laughs> Mike tagged. <laughs> you're tagged Mike, that was good. Um, that sounds how, good. What, what are your thoughts? You know, when I when I when I think about the tech trends around just healthcare in general, the the ability for patients to drive their own healthcare bus is becoming more and more ubiquitous. So I've got my, you know, we're talking about buying too many gadgets. You know, I'm talking to you through my Apple Max headphones, and I've got my Apple Watch on, and um, it, you know, I I check my sleep from the night before. How much deep sleep did I get? And and beer does not help you with your deep sleep. Just to let everybody know. Um, but, you know, the, you know, the whole country got mailed at home COVID diagnostic tests um, here just recently. And, you know, the, the, the world has figured out that there's a lot of diagnostic testing that can be done at home, um, whether it's an, an EKG or my watch also does my oxygen saturation level. There are uh, levels of blood tests. You can do a, a home hemoglobin A1C right now. Um, Rob showing his, uh, his COVID test there. Um, uh, there. And, and so all of these things are gonna be able to uh, be built into smart information systems that, that could learn about your health as an individual. So those of us that are providing services to patients, we're gonna be providing services to patients who have a whole lot more knowledge and want to be a whole lot more involved in driving the course of their clinical care. I think it's gonna be a, a, a exciting and an interesting challenge for us to adapt to. Mm. You know, Mike, you raised a good point because you know we've many of our agencies are now getting automated nine hundred and eleven calls from uh, a wearable that has monitored yep. something, either a collision or, uh, in some cases, an increased heart rate. Imagine that the nine hundred and eleven center of the future can actually tap into that device and and maybe even do some oxygen saturation so the dispatcher can look at it and say okay do i need to you know send a delta level response cuz their o2 sats are 81 or can i send a, a omega level response cuz their o2 sats are 98 on room air <laughs> which is going to i mean that'd be awesome that's great and, and and i can and i can imagine frank's cybersecurity brain right now thinking about <laughs> what all kinds of crazy risks that that scenario opens up yeah, it does. And, and, and it, it certainly creates some challenges uh, from a security standpoint. But I think as you as you look, and this is another slide I show my ASM class, from a 911 perspective, the, 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 this next generation 911 that we've been hearing about and seeing bits and pieces of and whatnot for a while now really has two layers to it, a, a people and a data or, or a tech layer. And, and I think that tech layer is, is a great opportunity and a significant concern as we look at, at where we're going in the future with that. Great, let's take a couple of the questions from our audience here. Um, first, um, Dwayne, we, we said we'll, we'll come to your question. It would appear most of the presenters are part of large, larger, more global entities. How can we downsize these efforts into smaller agencies without overcorrecting, overspending, or missing targets due to smaller resource buckets. So essentially, uh, many of us have these uh, larger budgets for IT. Um, how do you right size some of that for a smaller organization and what's it, what should the priorities be? And let's, uh, who hasn't, who hasn't spoke? Jonathan, let's, do, let's uh, toss that to you first. Yep, thanks, thanks Dwayne. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a problem for smaller agencies, but what we're seeing happen, you know, um, in the evolution of software and revolution of technology is that things that, you know, big companies, only big companies could access, smaller companies can now, right? So, um, for example, a couple of years ago or 10 years ago, a CAD was multi-million dollar investment. Now you can get it for through a subscription model on, you know, for a couple dollars a call. So, um, you know, access to uh, more powerful technology, the outsourcing of support, these kinds of things, you know, um, enable you to, um, you know, I guess acquire the type, this type of technology on the margin. So it's not as large of an investment. Um, and it's more on that, you know, subscription per call per click kind of opportunity. 
Um, and I think um, in, in the cloud, you know, has really helped us do that. And, and we're seeing, you know, EMS software, I think, um, come into that realm. Um, you know, a lot of scheduling systems, you know, all the stuff that scares Frank, all that cloud-based stuff, um, you know, it does make it affordable, um, right? Because you don't have to worry about the hardware and the IT support behind it, and, and they can sell it to the masses on a, on a much cheaper, um, you know, uh, you know, cost per visit or cost per transport, cost per response kind of a, uh, approach. So that'd be my, my first reaction to that. Thanks for the question. Okay, um, Rob, did you have any thoughts on this one as well? Because again, you, you with through Prodigy, you're involved with a number of different organizations. Sorry, fool for a second. I was on Zoom. Hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, did you have any comment about the right sizing from a larger organization to smaller organization? Since you, you work with a number of different agencies. Certainly Thank you. Are... Yeah, I was just going to say that for those that don't know, also my other part-time job is I'm also the executive director of the California Ambulance Association. And obviously, uh, whilst I'm working on one coast with Prodigy and Pro, I'm also working on the other coast with a lot of very, uh, very well, considerably smaller EMS organizations. And some of our members only have two ambulances. What am I, why am I saying that is think about your state associations, because to, no matter what your size or scale is, of course, there are go to folk within those organizations that have local ideas, local solutions, and actually can also then you can hunt as a pack from a legislative perspective, potentially from a purchasing perspective, from a best practice perspective. So what I would commend that if you haven't done so already, have a look at what local associations and organizations you have obviously you know we want you to join aim high we want you to join naamt etc but also think about what you have in, on a local perspective because that's where the best practice is also sitting awesome let's move to another question from the audience and this one is uh, especially for pete um what led your organization MedStart, to look towards outsourcing in the first place and in your opinion what were the main decision points that made this the right decision for you Okay, that's a great question too. So really, I think necessity was was the mother of this invention. Um, we, we did have a staff of um, five plus me and, and just a couple of points really quick. Number, number one is with that small of a staff, you had you had specialists. We had three people who were basically customer support specialists at various levels, uh, one network person and one applications person. And Sometimes that's the right mix. Other times it's not. Other times you need more people helping customers. And, and for those of you that have ever managed IT people, you know that once people have risen to a certain level, they don't want to do stuff that's that's lower than that. And so, um, you know, that that uh, pushed us in the direction of maybe looking for somebody who could who could just provide us the amount of support that we needed at the time that we needed it. And the other thing too, is that there was a lot of attrition. I, I touched on that briefly in my talk, but um, you know, the, the network specialist came to me and said, Hey, I want to specialize in security. And I had to tell him, you know, you, we are small enough that there is never going to be a dedicated security position. This, you know, this is always going to be combined with the network position and, you know, so he left. <laughs> um, so we were we were at the point where we using we had two vacant positions using a contractor for a third, and then we had two out of the out of the five positions filled. So, you know, at that point, um, I, I talked to my boss Ken at the time and said, you know, if we were going to look at outsourcing or making a move to outsourcing, this is the right time to do it. Uh, and and then we started doing a deep investigation, and we figured out that it made sense. I, did I did I cover the whole question? Okay. It, yes, excellent job. I'm going to toss this to Frank also because Frank, in your shop, I believe you keep some things in house. You, you outsource some components of your information system, your IT technology. Um, how do you balance that to decide what things to outsource, what things to keep internally, etc.? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you got the first thing that we did was realize that uh, that I am not an expert at running a data center. Uh, and there are lots of people out there that are experts at running a data center. Uh, and that was one of the first places we took because you quickly find out um, when you're in a hundred year old building um, that, that experiences two, you know, hundred year floods in the same period of time. And there's water mm -hmm. on the floor of your data center and it's hot in Oklahoma and the air conditioning quits working that you, uh, that you have a lot of environmental issues that create challenges. So uh, we quickly learned what we're good at and what we're not good at. We're not good at running a data center. And so we were able to make a move to move our entire infrastructure 
off our premise uh, and into a, a data center. Now, I still have control issues. I know that shocks some of you. Uh, and, and so we have our own private cage uh, at a very large co-located uh, data center. So we still have ultimate control of our, of our equipment, um, but they're responsible for power uh, and, and HVAC and those sorts of things. So that was part of it. We also attempted to do some um, IT outsourcing many years ago uh, in what was one of uh, my first attempts to figure out how to uh, spread some of the burden out. Uh, and it was, it was a bad experience. And it was a bad experience because I did just exactly what I told you all not to do is I, had, I found a solution of somebody that said they could do something for me. And I said, well, I think this will work. Um, and then we went down the path um, to figure out how to, how to make it work and not really knowing what our problem was at the time. And so uh, I, I, I applaud uh, Pete and the MedStar team for being able to so successfully uh, do what they've accomplished. And it's been a challenge, even for an organization my size. There's, um, and, and as my role has recently changed, uh, I'm still very much uh, in, in having some IT responsibilities as well. So I, we've got some of those challenges to do. So big or small, those challenges absolutely still exist. And, you know, Frank, if you could post a picture of you in your cage, because you said you had a cage in the data center, I, I think we'd all really like to see that. So I'll, uh, awesome. I'll work that up for you, Matt. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I just tweet it. it. It'd be good and you know, that'd be fine. All right, we have uh, one more question, um, I believe. From um, Kurt Mills. Yep. So Mike, we'll, we'll start with you since you were kind enough to help us find that question again. Uh, the question yeah. is, where would you suggest the best place to start to find a consultant to help improve employee engagement? And uh, and I, uh, in the background, have sent an email to uh, to Kurt introducing him to Scott Moore, um, who is um, my, my de definitely a good friend of mine, and um, I think one of the one of the best HR thinkers in our industry at this point in time, um, and. Um, uh, I, another couple of people, Tyler uh, Payer and uh, Chris Coker also kind of uh, jumped onto this. And um, I think there's uh, a set of uh, webinars that Scott has done that are available probably on the AAA uh, website. Um, and he's a, a, a super uh, easy to work with and an effective guy. So in, in my mind, that's the place I would start. Yeah, absolutely. And Jonathan, part of the questions was, uh, and, and out of interest for ourselves as well, um, real quick on the Facebook for the workforce, for the workplace. Um, tell us just a quick, you know, one minute elevator speech. How does that work? How did it help with your employee engagement? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so, you know, actually all of the above. So uh, because you have a multi-generational workforce, they all communicate differently, right? And so, for example, boomers will do email, um, you know, Xers are kind of between email and text. Uh, millennials are more social media, you know, based. And then Gen Zers um, are, take that, that even to like the next level of extreme, um, you know, in terms of how they communicate with each other. And so ultimately you have to be able to, um, you know, respond to the entire audience. So oftentimes, um, you know, we will communicate out changes in practice or policy or procedure, things like that across all mediums. Um, most of the communication that we do kind of more in real time associated with engagement are done on our internally controlled social media platforms. Um, but like I said, the, the value of that live broadcast capability uh, with video like we're doing right now um, and having the ability to interact with the audience like we're doing right now, you know, gives us a whole new capability in EMS that we never had before to be able to literally reach, you know, all of our providers in this, again, 24-7 geographically dispersed area. Um, you know, in terms of the other question real quick, too, about, you know, how to, uh, how to find assistance, you know, there's a lot of great companies out there. There are other um, EMS agencies. Scott Scott Moore's great. Um, you know, Safe Tech Solutions and uh, John Becknell and Aaron Reinhardt, amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, and there's others out there um, that um, you know can help you with this journey. And it's it's definitely not one of those situations where you go and buy a piece of software and think it's going to call and solve your engagement problem. Right. It, this is a cultural shift that has to be engineered. Um, and like I said, PDS aid. Um, throughout your entire organization in order to truly flip things around so that you're an organization that people want to desire to work for. So. 
Thanks, Rob. Were you raising your hand or are you? Or, or were no, you I am raising my hand. Uh, this is a subject waving very, to the landscape guy. This is a subject very dear to my heart. No landscape guys today, I'm pleased to say. But um, the first battle, as always, is communication. And uh, whilst we're talking about, you know, folk that can help us along the way, we can also help ourselves by becoming the master of both internal and external communication. And this is by way of a plug for our amazing Aim High PIOs that are going on the circuit this year to talk about uh, at AAA, at uh, EMS World and various other places. Uh, and I'm sure we can even put on a webinar about how to keep your organization in the public eye, how to communicate both externally and internally with your uh, members of staff. And of course, making them all, you know, feel, let's, let's be honest, feel loved. I just spent a bit of time analyzing both the EMS one EMS survey and also the police one, police survey. And actually the key question that came up uh, in, uh, in, in Chris, uh, Chris's question, of course, is about staff engagement. And so therefore we all have to do better right now because of the pandemic has put us all at distance, put us all on Zoom, taken us away from the face-to-face -face stuff. And so by mastering you know, the communication tools that you have and actually by you know, even having that online presence, and of course, that, you know, MBWA, Chip Decker's watching, MBWA, management by walking about, always good. Um, but uh, we've got some some resources, I think, that Aim High and, you know, the PIO team can share as the year goes forward as well, Matt. Excellent. And um, I, I love the question or Jonathan's response, <clears throat> excuse me, about the multi-generational workforce. <clears throat> we have a computer, a computer software uh, for our CAD called Logis, and Logis has the ability to text message with the 911 center. And it's and we still have radios, of course, which nobody really ever used unless they're over forty. So you've, you've got the 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 you know the older workforce that are still using the radio to to call and, and ask for things, but everybody else is text messaging to the dispatch center on their Logis handheld device, and it's just it, it's hilarious. I'm still looking so. for my bag phone somewhere. I don't know where it got to, but the <laughs> with the one hour battery life, right? If you just you know burned your ear, yeah, yeah, those. yeah. That's the one you get yeah you know, get brain cancer. All right, last question as we we're kind of talking about this a little bit is. Um, there are a lot of parts of our country that are rural and frontier, and there is an oftentimes technology gap because you can't get a signal. And, and some areas have 3G, and I know it's finally sunsetting, but then what do those areas do? FirstNet was supposed to help part of that, so maybe some folks can talk about FirstNet. But um, so what do you do in some of those rural or frontier areas if you really have limited bandwidth and the inability to have some of that connectivity? And we'll start with... Um, Let's, uh, you know, Frank, you're sort of in a rural area. Let, let's start with you. <laughs> yeah, real quick, just, uh, I, it's an interesting conversation. I just happened to be having a conversation uh, with our Lieutenant Governor from Oklahoma uh, here just a couple of weeks ago, talking about, um, and it was, it started off as a 911 conversation about, you know, we've just got 911 service to all of our counties within the last few years in Oklahoma. Uh, and, and so, this is something that is that is becoming more important and there are a lot of rural broadband initiatives out there and still that's that's kind of land-based communications uh, but one of the things that i that i think would be important is that we have to work with our uh, government as much as i hate to say that because sometimes that's more fun than others uh, but but that's one of the important things that our 911 uh, board here in oklahoma and others are doing is to help push the importance of um, some level of wireless communication capabilities out into those rural areas. Uh, and part of the problem why they don't understand it, because they're only thinking about it usually from an education standpoint and maybe from a commerce standpoint, nobody understands that there's a significant public safety component to having that wireless available and, and not only wireless cell phone service, but wireless data service available in many of those areas. So that's something that, that, uh, that I've had uh, an ongoing conversation with here lately. So I just, I just have to say that please don't cover everything because all my vacation spots are spots where there's no cell service by design. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to screw up and have to be connected for the entire rest of my life. You remember that Super Bowl commercial from a couple of years ago where the guys are going out camping and they keep checking for cell service. And as soon as they get a spot that doesn't have any, that's where they stop, right? <laughs> kind of yes. And I would uh, also point out, uh, Mike, there is an off button on your phone. Oh, he, now, see, he called you out. Um, that, that, that's implying I have better impulse control than you think. <laughs> uh, sorry. 
Nice. John? So, so I'm going to ruin Mike's vacation even more. Um, so, you know, there, there are some technologies that are on the brink of, of – some that are out there and some that are on the brink. So Starlink, if you're not familiar with Starlink, um, you know, uh, which is um, Elon Musk's, um, you know, project um, that I believe is also being federally funded uh, to help solve for some of these rural communication issues with high-speed Internet via satellite um, at affordable rates. Um, I'm on the list waiting for my dish to come so I can start playing with it. Um, it's pretty high high speed bandwidth, pretty much anywhere where you can get a line of sight in the sky, and it's about ninety bucks, ninety nine bucks a month from a from a subscription standpoint. The other thing is, um, you know, FirstNet definitely is working on this problem. They know it's part of the issue. They've got a lot of interesting tools out there. Um, newer concept called HPUE, which is high power user equipment, which allows you to increase the uh, transmission. Um, uh, power, you know, on cell phones and things like that to actually get you longer distance to cell sites as well as um, really using satellite backhaul and creating, uh, you know, a bubble um, in an affordable way using CRDs and other go kits and things like that where you can actually bring um, satellite communication with you. So if you're in a zero data uh, capable area and you want to do a, like a telehealth visit, for example, in a rural environment, you can do that. As well as, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, these uh, tele, um, this technology, the uh, satellite communicators, right? Um, there's like Spot and Garmin and other things where you have the ability to actually send uh, messaging back and forth where there's zero, um, you know, satellite, uh, or excuse me, zero cell phone service. So there are ways to do it. Um, it does cost a little bit, but um, there are also, I'm sure, grants out there. And then once Starlink's on, online 100% across the U.S., which I believe is supposed to happen in early, sometime this year, early this year, um, you know, that's definitely a solution to be looking at. And if you get that cool Starlink tracker app, you'll actually know when they're going over your house or whatever at night, and they are phenomenal to watch, just this whole train of things coming over. And I think, I don't know, John, I don't know if it was Google or uh, one of them that actually literally floated some trial balloons where they had these high altitude balloons with internet connections and they tested them in rural America and South America and, and other places. Um, and some of the apps tracking those and these balloons would be at literally 50 to 65,000 feet uh, was just amazing to watch. I think, I think that was a Google yep. sponsored um, pilot. Yep. There's lots of things like that going on in drone based, you know, uh, platforms as well. L lots of interesting things happening in the, that space, especially in the disaster space, but a lot of that will bleed over into the everyday use space as well. Yep. Excellent. Also, I want to not forget um, a, a big shout out to Dale from High Performance EMS. He's been tweeting out a whole bunch of information, including the Pedisms, some of them, and um, has just done a great job covering this event live on his Twitter feed. So if you don't follow that, it's High Performance EMS is the Twitter feed, and Dale does a, a great job doing that. So Dale, thank you very much for um, putting that stuff out there. Um, so in the, in the next two minutes, let's do a round robin through the uh, group before we close and literally just ask for any final closing thoughts. We, we have a lot of attendees here. So let's go around. Mike Tegman, we'll start with, with you, sir. I would just uh, remind people that with all of the cool data technologies and everything we think about, uh, don't forget that there are people that we're caring for and people that are caring for the people that we're caring for and that that interface with the, I think they call it wetware sometimes, is uh, a vital component of everything we think about. Yeah, that carbon-based interface, very, very important. Uh, Rob, Lawrence. I think just to follow on from what Mike said, that uh, the first and last battle is always communication. And whether it's data, whether it's uh, Facebook, or whether it's just interfacing with the, the, uh, the, the human resource, that you know, don't forget your people and maximize the communication in any which way you can. Great counsel. Um, Jonathan and Pete on deck. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, as I mentioned before, really look at the soulful side of your organization and how you can fortify it with technology. Um, you know, um, really understanding that that side of things is that side of things is going to help you on the engagement side and, and help, I think, transform your organization from not just being smart, but being one that people want to come work for and be engaged with and want to stay at. So and technology can help you get there. But it's all about the people. <clears throat> Thanks, Jonathan. Pete with Frank on deck. Yeah, I would just say um, focus on, on when it comes to IT, focus on what you do really well. And 
when you're looking at what you don't do well, just try to be creative and uh, look at alternative solutions because they are out there. And the smaller you are, uh, the more likely it is that you can find somebody else that can that can help you and that can do it better, faster, and cheaper than you can. Hopefully that's not true about the whole agency, right, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> no, what I said when, two, it right? no, <laughs> when it came to IT. That's when it came to IT. Like Mike and John always tell us, you know, better, faster, cheaper, pick any two. Yeah. Um, Frank, <laughs> Frank, you're on. So absolutely. A uh, couple of thoughts. Number one, security, uh, cybersecurity in particular, uh, it is it is always going to be a double-edged sword. Um, it You can... Uh, you can eliminate so much risk, and in the process of doing so, you can create uh, such a secure system that no one is actually able to use it. Uh, that would ultimately be a very secure system because nobody can use it, nobody can access it, um, but then you don't get anything done. So understand that cybersecurity uh, is, is all about risk evaluation and risk tolerance and understanding it. Uh, number two, um, you know, uh, decisions that we make from an IT perspective, uh, whether it's about security, whether it's about uh, team member engagement, whatever it is, are rarely, okay, they're never made in a vacuum. And the only ones that come out really bad are the ones that are made in a vacuum. So communicate, ask questions, seek for understanding, uh, but ultimately uh, do not be the single person making those decisions uh, bring everybody else out on the limb with you because it's so much easier to go down with a bunch of people in flames than it is just by yourself. One of the best lessons I got from an emergency manager over in Florida was never carry the coffin alone. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we get, before we thank our um, panelists to do here in just a quick second, just quick note about aim high. If you want to learn more about us, go to the website, aimhigh.mobi. Um, when we were brainstorming the name for this organization, it, that domain was available, which was beautiful. Jonathan, uh, Rob was there when we were doing it. I think Jonathan was there as well and others. And um, that was like a God thing, right? Because we just um, found that. Uh, our next um, planned webinar, just so that you guys know, is going to be best practices in mitigating supply chain disruptions. And we're going to have logistics and purchasing um, experts from AIM High member organizations um, helping us understand some of those best practices that they do to make sure that we can uh, might get morphine on the ambulances, right? So they can not have their control chart um, dive down. Uh, just again, as we close, thank you very much to our panelists, probably the, the greatest mind trust in information technology and um, information systems, data management and, and process and quality improvement using data. So special thanks to John, Pete, Rob, uh, Frank and Mike, you guys were awesome. Thank you for spending your time with us and, and all the preparation. Um, at, Amanda, do you want to give us any closing words about logistics on recordings of the webinar, et cetera? Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. So I have put the link to the uh, AIM High website in the chat. Um, if you missed it here, the recording will be available there tomorrow. It will also be emailed out to all registrants. If you can't wait that long, we were also live streaming to Facebook. So you could actually play it back right now and share it with all your friends. Um, the deck will be emailed out with the recording. And if you're going to go to Facebook Live to, to watch it right away, make sure you catch that Amanda double bubble trouble thing that she said in the beginning, beginning which none of us would be able to repeat. Um, so congratulations, Amanda, for actually being able to say it well. You did a great job. Thanks, everybody. Have a very safe rest of the day. And thanks again for joining us and watch out for the next one. Thank you. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Brad. Appreciate the leadership. Bye-bye.